we can see the astronauts are now working with SpaceX suit technicians and the closeout team. And that looks, yeah, that's our commander, Shane Kimbrough. There's uh, Megan MacArthur getting helped into her uh, gloves in her spacesuit. And mission specialist Thomas Pesquet will be making his second trip to space. But that's Aki Hoshide uh, having a laugh <laughs> with some of the uh, suit technicians. There's Shane Kimbrough, pilot Megan MacArthur in the front. Megan blowing kisses. <laughs> Thomas and Aki ready for their ride to the space station. And here they come, the Crew 2 astronauts taking their first steps outside before their journey to space. Yay! I love this moment. They're now going to have the opportunity to wave goodbye from a safe distance. And it looks like Bob Benkin is there with uh, the son of he and Megan MacArthur. departure on schedule. All right, so we just heard that announcement that the crew has departed the operations and checkout building on schedule. And we can see the astronauts inside the crew access arm. Commander Shane Kimbrough, here he is climbing inside Crew Dragon Endeavor. We call this process ingress. We see we now see suit technicians uh, will help the, the crew members get buckled in. As you can see, the side hatch has just been closed. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Mission and lift off. Guys, one Endeavor and Crew Two. Copy one alpha. Endeavor launches once again. Four astronauts from three countries on Crew Two making their way to the one and only International Space Station. The vehicle is pitching down range. Nine Merlin engines on the first stage providing 1.7 billion pounds of thrust. Hearing good calls for first stage performance so far. and thank you for joining us. Earlier today at 5.49 a.m., NASA and SpaceX Crew-2 mission blasted off from Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A. The Crew-2 mission is the second crew rotation flight of the Crew Dragon spacecraft and Falcon 9 rocket, carrying NASA astronauts Shane Kimbrough and Megan MacArthur, JASA astronaut Aki Hoshide, and ESA astronaut Tama Pesquet to the International Space Station. My name is Jackie McGinnis, NASA Press Secretary, and I'm joined here today by Acting NASA Administrator Steve Jersick, Elon Musk, Chief Engineer at SpaceX, Kathy Leaders, Associate Administrator for NASA's Human Exploration Operations Mission Directorate, Steve Stitch, Manager of NASA's Commercial Crew Program, Joe Montalbano, Manager of the International Space Station Program at NASA, Hiroshi Sasaki, Vice President and Director General of JAXA's Human Spaceflight Technology Directorate, and Frank Javina, Manager of the International Space Station Program at the European Space Agency. Each speaker will make brief remarks, and then we will open the lines for questions from the media. For reporters on the line, press star one to get into the queue to ask a question. Please remember to state your name and media affiliation before you speak, and address the speaker you'd like to answer your question. Please only ask one question and address one per speaker at a time. You may enter the queue again and ask additional questions. First up, we'll hear from Acting Administrator Steve Jersick. Hey, thank you, Jackie, and it's uh, just great to be here today. Uh, so first, I want to thank and congratulate the, the NASA team, SpaceX team, and our international partners. Um, what we do is really challenging, but also rewarding, and we could not do it without our commercial and international partners. So thank you and congratulations. Um, watching a launch from Kennedy Space Center never gets old for me. Um, I, I've watched many launches, and, uh, and watching a pre-dawn launch is especially 
um, exciting and, and just visually stunning. And this this launch was and um, a little bit different for me this time as acting administrator. Um, but uh, again, I'm just congratulations team. I could not be more proud of the team. It's been a really incredible year for NASA, um, for all our mission areas, but particularly for human spaceflight with uh, with three launches in 11 months. And it's hard to believe it was just uh, 11 months ago, m last May, where we were in the, the room, we were watching the launch from today and doing the first flight readiness, readiness review for a human exploration mission in just about a decade. Uh, and, and then we did the Demo-2 mission. And uh, I, I just it, it's just been incredible to be a part of it. Um, this marks many important milestones, um, but a really uh, is important for getting a regular cadence of crew to the station and back. Um, and it's going to really accelerate the research and technology development that we're able to do on station. And I'm really looking forward to um, what crew, I, I've, looked, I've really enjoyed watching what crew one has been able to accomplish. And I'm going to really enjoy what crew two is going to do um, on, I, on their six month stint on ISS. It took, it took 10 years to get here um, to achieve this bold vision we have for commercial crew. And, uh, and again, uh, it's been amazing what the team has been able to accomplish. Um, you know, uh, the, what we do on ISS is important, um, not only for the research and technology de development that we do for here on Earth, but also to prepare for what we're gonna do in the future. Um, so ISS is not only important for our commercial um, activities in space and stimulating those, but also for our exploration missions. Um, we'll continue to celebrate the marvels of the International Space Station and the science and technology development that it will be conducting um, as we look to the future of sending astronauts um, to lunar orbit and eventually the surface and then our ultimate goal of sending astronauts to Mars. So coupled with our robotic exploration and, uh, and our Earth science missions that look down at, at Earth, I'm proud to be a part of this team that makes it all happen and look easy, and I can assure you it is not, it is not easy. Um, but we have an incredibly talented team at NASA along with our uh, commercial international partners, and I know they've gotten the job done this last year, and I know they're gonna get the job done moving forward, so thank you. Thanks, and now we have Elon Musk, Chief Engineer at NASA, uh, SpaceX. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, I think, um, actually, Steve said, said really, um, all the really important things. I'm just really proud of the, the SpaceX team and the and honored to be partnered with uh, with NASA and uh, and and uh, helping with Jackson and ESA as well. Uh, so um, uh, yeah, just thr thrilled to be part of advancing uh, human spaceflight and uh, looking forward to um, yeah going going beyond uh, Earth orbit to the, the Moon and Mars um, and helping make uh, humanity a space bearing civilization and uh, a multi planet species one day. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have Kathy Leaders, Associate Administrator for NASA's Human Exploration Operations Mission Directorate. Wow. I mean, I, I think I'm just always uh, amazed at the NASA and in particular the SpaceX team that diligently stepped through and got us ready to fly once again. And um, really want to thank Elon and the team um, from a HEO perspective and uh, thank uh, Steve Stitch and Joel here who have been working really hard to keep this cadence going. It's a very, very, very exciting time for human exploration right now, just like Steve said. Um, you know, Joel every day advances science and technology on the International Space Station, and that has really been enabled with the activities um, and the flights that SpaceX has provided for us over the last 11 months, like we said, and the commercial crew team has been working to keep that science and technology development going. Um, Joel's had a had a busy month. We were talking the other day about he just had a, a, a Soyuz launch, a Soyuz landing. Now we've got a commercial crew uh, launch, and uh, you know we're going to be obviously working through and making sure we get the four crew members there and safely to station. But then Steve and Joel are going to be getting ready for a Crew-1 landing with the SpaceX folks. So very, very, very exciting time for us. In addition, we've got a core stage coming in next week. Um, 
which will be joining the uh, solid rocket motors that have now been stacked in the VAB, and the Orion spacecraft that's now been fueled, uh, getting ready for our first Artemis One uncrewed demonstration mission. So we're going to be working and, and getting our exploration system ready to go, and very, very excited about that. In addition, last um, week we had announced to uh, SpaceX the uh, human landing system demonstration uh, mission too. So um, I, this is, you know, when I, when I took over for HEOAA, I thought after that Demo 2 mission, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to be missing out on these fun missions. But really, I kind of have the best of both all worlds now with all the cool missions that Joel and Steve the uh, Artemis team's doing and uh, further missions going forward to Moon and then eventually Mars. So very, very exciting time for us. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Now we have Steve Stitch, manager of NASA's Commercial Crew Program. Uh, th thank you, Jackie. Uh, as I watched the, the video play before we uh, started our opening remarks, it's just reflected on the last two years. As Steve Jersey said, we have now three crewed missions in, in just over 11 months. And, and when I think about, watch the video, I just think about the team that we have between NASA, Commercial Crew, and SpaceX, an incredible team that refurbished this Crew-1 booster that just flew uh, our Crew-2 uh, team to the space station, refurbishing the Dragon spacecraft over these last 10 months, and just all the hard work uh, across the country from the SpaceX team, the NASA team, and certifying it. You know, I was thinking about some of the meetings we have, and, and SpaceX and NASA work so well together. At times during these meetings, people will finish each other's sentences. One person on the SpaceX side may say something, and NASA knows exactly what that person is thinking. It's just tremendous teamwork. Uh, Dragon's doing well in orbit. Uh, the crew is out of their suits right now. Uh, the crew is uh, in the middle of a meal. Uh, they'll go to bed uh, this afternoon here about 2 Eastern and sleep in until about, uh, about 10 p.m. And, uh, and then they'll get in their suits uh, Saturday morning at about 2.50 a.m. Eastern time uh, for the final uh, rendezvous and docking. And they'll uh, make contact about 5.10 a.m. Eastern with a final docking around 5.23 a.m. So kind of a busy time for the crew and the ground teams as they look over Dragon. As I said, Dragon is doing very well. Uh, today the weather cooperated. You know, we moved the launch one day. We looked at the abort weather and the downrange abort track wasn't very good for Thursday. We moved that launch uh, one day, and the weather just cooperated great today. Um, you know, the vehicle improvements that uh, SpaceX uh, embarked upon for this flight, uh, adding capability to, uh, to handle onshore winds today was a difference, really, in uh, getting off uh, with the onshore winds uh, with the vehicle we had for Crew-1 and Demo-2. We would not have gotten off. The countdown was very smooth. We worked a couple of things, uh, checking out a, a, a cover on the Draco thruster and making sure the hydraulic system was ready to go. But other than that, the countdown was extremely smooth today. Uh, a lot of people worked very hard to put that together. And then, uh, as Kathy alluded to, it's a busy time for us. We'll, uh, we'll get the crew docked uh, on Saturday. And then uh, after we get them safely on board, we'll start to focus on the crew one return. and. Uh, preliminarily, we're looking at undocking on Wednesday, April the 28th uh, at about 7 a.m. Uh, Eastern Time, and the targeted touchdown is Tallahassee with, uh, with a landing on Wednesday, April 28th, about 1240. Um, it's a busy time for us. It's an exciting time. It's the first time we've done this direct handover, and uh, I'm just really proud to be part of the team. Thanks, Steve. Now we have Joel Montalbano, manager of the ISS program at NASA. Hello again, that just an outstanding launch and a great way to end the week. You know, we're excited to have another commercial crew mission on board and in space coming to the International Space Station. And these missions allow us to keep our utilization research program, our technology development for Artemis and our low Earth orbit commercialization activities on board the International Space Station moving forward with an incredible amount of steam. You know, these, these missions, they enable these activities on board. So we're excited to have it. We're also excited to have 11 people on board after docking and it'll only be a short time, but uh, it's something that we've been preparing for and we're looking forward to it. After launch, we did inform the crew on board the International Space Station that we had a successful launch and company was on its way. They did pass uh, congratulations to the team on the ground 
And I'd like to also pass my congratulations to the commercial crew program and the SpaceX teams for just an outstanding, outstanding launch today. Thank you. Thanks, Joel. Now we have Hiroshi Sasaki, Vice President and Director General of JAXA's Human Spaceflight Technology Directorate. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm Hiroshi Sasaki, a Vice President for JAXA, responsible for human spaceflight and space explorations. Uh, first of all, uh, on behalf of JAXA, I'd like to express uh, my sincere thanks to NASA, SpaceX, and all staff who have been working for these missions under the severe COVID-19 situations. Uh, as reported earlier, the Crew Dragon uh, was launched into the orbit nominally. The mission is sequence is still uh, going on, but I'd like to congratulate all of you on the successful launch. I have already seen Crew Dragon launch for Japanese astronaut Soichi Noguchi last November, and I am so delighted uh, again to be part of the team uh, here today. Uh, it is uh, really a great pleasure, not only for me, but also the Japan, that the two Japanese astronauts, Soichi and Aki, on board the operational flight of Crew Dragon twice in a row. Uh, they will meet together at the ISS. I believe uh, this is brought by the very close tie between Japan and the U.S. for many years through the ISS program. Aki Hoshide, uh, on board the Crew 2, will contribute to the Expedition 65-62 mission as a commander. I hope he will jointly create fruitful outcomes together with his fellow astronauts, working also very closely with colleagues on the ground. During these missions, uh, JAXA is planning to perform various scientific and technical research, such as the protein cro uh, cro crystal growth for medicine design, contributing to the people on the ground, and demonstration on enhanced water recovery system, preparing the future exploration mission as well. JAXA is also going to hold a robotic program challenge with NASA to inspire young people around the world. I am looking forward to see that Aki will contribute to those activities through the great teamwork. I believe the Crew 2 mission is a symbol of international and industry partnership. Four crew members from NASA, ESA, and JAXA on board Crew Dragon, launched by the SpaceX. I believe it is the first time that NASA, ESA, and the JAXA astronauts flying to and stay for a long duration at the ISS together. Now, human space activities are really a great global endeavor that people pushing the human boundaries from the Leo to the moon and even uh, beyond. I am confident that the international partnership is truly important and Japan will contribute to take part in this human endeavor by making the best use of the, our entities, such as uh, ecosystem and uh, transfer vehicles. We are going together. Once again, congratulations on the successful launch. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we have Frank Devina, manager of the ISS program at ESA. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, what a great day and uh, what an excitement to see the four crew members and uh, of course our ESA astronaut uh, Thomas Pesquet launch from uh, Crew Dragon uh, to the International Space Station. Uh, it's a great uh, time for us. Uh, we have uh, permanently now four USOS crew members on orbit, uh, meaning that uh, the crew time that we have available for science and utilization has uh, drastically increased and uh, we thank the partners and uh, of course uh, SpaceX and uh, NASA but all the international partners uh, to make this uh, happen. Uh, Toma will have a busy schedule. Uh, on the 15th of July we will also launch the uh, MLM module with our colleagues from uh, Roscosmos and on that module will be the European robotic arm. And so Thomas will also be involved in the commissioning and the checkout of this uh, European robotic arm that we have been waiting for long uh, to launch to the uh, International Space Station. And after Thomas, we will uh, have Matthias Maurer that will uh, launch uh, in the fall of this year. And after that, uh, Samantha Cristoforetti. So for the first time, 
we will have three ESA astronauts in a row that will be permanently on board of the International Space Station. So really uh, great times uh, to come for, for the European Space Agency. Uh, all the science technology that uh, we do, it's uh, of course for the benefit of uh, people here on Earth and uh, for humankind. Uh, but it's also to prepare for the future. Uh, ESA, uh, together with our colleagues from JAXA and Canada, are part of the Gateway program. We are looking forward to further work with NASA on those programs to have our ESA astronauts fly to the Gateway, but not stop there. We also want uh, to have in the future our ESA astronauts walk on the surface of the Moon. So exciting times uh, to be in uh, human spaceflight and uh, really looking forward to further enhance this great international cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder for reporters on the line, press star one to get into the queue and ask a question. First up, we have Marcia Dunn with the Associated Press. Thank you. Gorgeous launch. Uh, for Elon, could you describe your emotions at liftoff and does it get any easier easier for you on a personal level, level being responsible for lives after three crew flights? Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's very, very intense. Um, I suppose it does get a little bit easier, but it's still extremely intense. And uh, I, I usually can't sleep the night before launch, and that's sort of true of the, the night before this one. So I haven't had much sleep. Um, but uh, you know, fortunately, we've got a great team that are really, um, really proud of the incredible work the team has done in partnership with NASA. And uh, yeah, I suppose it'll, it, it gets a little bit easier, but, but still, still pretty intense, I have to say. <laughs> um, so. Um, yeah, I can't. I can't I, it's hard to believe that uh, we're here doing this. Quite frankly, you know, feels like a dream. Thank you. And now we have Bill Hardwood with CBS. Thanks. Uh, and, and again, congratulations to all of you uh, for this launch. Three Crew Dragon flights in less than a year is quite a record, and, and I guess for Mr. Musk, I realize this current flight is less than two hours old right now, but can you tell us anything about the schedule for the next flight, the inspiration uh, for launch schedule? And, and one question I think a lot of us have is, is, how do you do that flight without working with NASA? I mean, in terms of crew quarters and suit up and facilities in general, thanks. Um, yeah, well, I think we'll, we'll still be obviously uh, coordinating with NASA and, and uh, the that that'll be you know sort of a, a free flyer mission with um, a, a a kind of a big uh, kind of glass dome in the front instead of a docking adapter. So it should give a quite a different feel for like it should really you should really feel like you're you're in space more than one you know because it'll just be you just surrounded by a glass um, or acrylic technically. But um, yeah, so yeah, we're looking forward to that mission. Um, but obviously, still be work, you know, working in coordination with NASA for that mission. So um, that that should be hopefully, like as the name suggests, uh, inspiration. You know, and actually, you know, I think that's the that's the thing about you know human spaceflight is that it's it's one of those things that makes people excited about the future. Uh, you, you know, you look forward to you know we wake up in the morning and think, hey, what's going to be great about the future? It's like, man, if we're out there and we're a space faring civilization, and and Visiting other planets and those exciting planets, I think that's that's what gets one of those things that gets people fired up, you know. Yeah, certainly gets me fired up, obviously. <laughs> Thank you. Now we have Eric Berger with Ars Technica. Hi. Good morning, and congratulations to uh, to everyone on this. Um, a couple of questions. First of all, maybe for. For Steve Stitch, can you comment on the fact that, you know, in less than four years, I guess, or it's been about four years since SpaceX first launched a Falcon 9 rocket for the second time, the SCS-10 mission, um, has it been a, a rapid process to try to get to the certification of the Falcon 9, you know, uh, previously flown rockets for crew? And, and Elon, can you comment on the uh, Human Landing System Award last Friday? You know, how important is it to SpaceX that NASA showed that kind of confidence in Starship and, and is now talking about using the vehicle for the moon and, and potentially Mars. Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll take the first question regarding the certification of the Falcon 9. You, you know, for, uh, for the first flight for Demo 2 for Bob and Doug, we had gone through a certification of the, of the rocket uh, for that very, for one flight, so we had started to understand the systems. We actually follow the whole fleet of all the flights that SpaceX flies. SpaceX has been a great partner in sharing data in every single flight, and we were able to look at the performance. So over time, we started to understand uh, how the engines perform, how the rocket itself performs. And then in a partnership with SpaceX, we went through and looked at uh, every single piece of the launch vehicle, uh, the engines, uh, the structures, uh, everything about the reentry and the heating, and we were able to, uh, in about 10 months, go through uh, on the order of 400 or so certification products. Uh, in addition to those products delivered by SpaceX, we also did our independent analysis uh, of certain key components from a structural perspective. We looked at the, the heating for entry and, and did an independent uh, assessment of that to make sure that we were comfortable with the, with the margins. And so it was a, quite an extensive effort in 10 months by our team and an incredible partnership between NASA and SpaceX. And Elon? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a great honor to be chosen by NASA to uh, return uh, people to the moon. Um, it's been now almost half a century since humans were last on the moon. It's too long. We need to get back there and and, uh, and have a permanent base on the moon. I think a, a, like a big permanently occupied base on the moon. And, uh, and then build a city on Mars and become a space you know, like a space civilization, a multi-planet species. We don't want to be one of those single-planet species. We want to be a multi-planet species, um, you know. So, yeah. But. Thank you. Now we have Irene Klotz with Aviation Week. Thanks, Jackie, and congratulations. That was a really exotic launch this morning. Um, for Elon, um, how will the uh, funding from HLS impact your design and development and schedule for Starship? And what's been kind of your technological challenge challenges with the project so far? Well, I mean, this is definitely really helpful uh, in funding this the Starship program. Um, it's mostly been funded internally thus far, um, and it's pretty expensive. Um, as you can tell, if you've been watching videos, we've, you know, blown up a few of them. Um, so, uh, excitement guaranteed, um, <laughs> one way or another. Um, so it's it's a it's a tough uh, vehicle to build because we're we're trying to crack this nut of uh, a, a rapid and fully and ra you know fully and rapidly reusable rocket. And I apologize, I'm a, I'm a little slow enough to take care of them, going on not much sleep at all, um, but. The, the thing that's really important to revolutionize space is a, ra a rapidly reusable rocket. That's reliable, too. <laughs> um, so that's really what, what needs to happen. Um, if, that, if, if that can be done, then the, co the cost of access to uh, orbit and beyond can be reduced by potentially a factor of 100 or more. So um, that's, that's really what 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 is um, most important about it's got to be done by some, somebody's got to do this, um, and uh, and if and if that is if you have rapid and complete reusability, then that that opens up that's that is the gateway to the heavens. That's what matters. That's what we're trying to get done, and the support of NASA is make, makes a huge difference. Thank you. To media on the line, just a reminder to focus your questions this morning on the Crew 2 mission. That would be greatly appreciated. Uh, next up, we have Joey Roulette with The Verge. Hey, thanks, Jackie, and congrats, everyone, on a, on a good launch. This question is for Elon Musk. Um, from your perspective, I was just wondering if you are plugged in or if you're having any deal with the holdup on getting an agreement with the Russians for flying cosmonauts on Crew Dragon is. Uh, would you like to see cosmonauts flying on Crew Dragon sooner than later. And uh, since HLS was mentioned earlier, I just was just wondering um, how soon will Starship be able to put humans on the moon? Thanks. I, I do not have any insight on, on the, with regard to the cosmonauts, but of course we would be, uh, you know, honored to fly um, 
Cosmonauts on Dragon, um, but I do not uh, have any insight into any potential objections. I, I'm not sure, perhaps this may be just a communications uh, breakdown, I don't know. Um, but uh, I don't have any insight into it. I mean, it's, we're, we're actually working through the agreements right now, and I think people understand, and I think we talked about this in the post-FR news conference, that people understand the importance of, you know, crew swaps for supportability of ISS, and so we're working through that um, and getting that agreement in place. It, it takes a while sometimes. I found out there's lots of people to coordinate with. So it <laughs> doesn't happen as fast probably as I want it to, um, but it's, it's, we're working through it. Thank you. And now we have Stephen Clark with Space Flight Now. Thank you and congratulations to everyone. Uh, my question is for Elon Musk as well. Um, this was the first time uh, you've launched astronauts on a reused Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon, although it's far from the first time you've done that for, you know, overall through your flight history. Uh, I'm curious, uh, you know, as you develop Starship uh, to, to focus on that rapid full reusability as you're flying your manifest with Falcon 9, um, how many missions do you think you can get out of a Falcon 9 booster? Um, and is that something you're, you're willing to push the limit on to, you know, keep flying one until it breaks or, um, you know, for a Starlink mission, for example, or, or are you, do you see like a, a, a plateau or a ceiling in terms of flight number for a Falcon 9 booster going forward? Well, that doesn't seem to be, um, there doesn't, doesn't seem to be any uh, obvious limit to the uh, reusability of the, the vehicle. Um, and yeah, we do intend to fly the Falcon 9 booster until we see some kind of a failure with the Starlink missions, obviously just to have that be a life leader. Um, and we're just actually talking in the in the control room. Uh, so we're talking with the um, between SpaceX and NASA, and we're like wondering, you know, what like what's the optimal number of launches for? You know, do you want to be on a on a brand new booster, or well, you probably don't want to be on the life leader for for a crew mission. <laughs> um, but uh, but you know, it's probably good to have a, a, a flight or two under its belt for the booster to have flown, you know, once or twice. I think if it was like a you know an aircraft. Uh, coming out of an aircraft factory, you'd want the aircraft to probably have gone on a test flight or two before, you know, you put passengers on. So, uh, you know, I think that's probably, you know, a couple of flights is a good number to have for a, for a crew booster. And, um, and in the meantime, we'll, we'll keep flying the, uh, the life leader. We've got nine flights on one of the boosters. We're going to have a tenth flight soon with a Starlink mission. And, um, yeah, we're learning a lot about reusability and it's it's a hard problem for rockets. I mean, there's a reason it's not it has really, you know, right now, Falcon 9 is the only um, partially reusable rocket being flown. You know, with the booster coming back and the, the fairing coming back, but we still can't, we don't reuse the upper stage or the Dragon trunk, and so with the Starship, we're aiming just like hopefully hopefully reuse the whole thing. Um, but it's, this is a hard problem for rockets, that's for sure. You know, it's taken us uh, we're like 19 years in now. Um, but I, I think the, the I think we can see I, the the Starship design can work. It, it's just it's a hard thing to solve, um, and the support of NASA is very much appreciated in this regard. Um, I don't know. I, th I think it's gonna. I think it's gonna work. I think it's gonna work. Thank you. And next up, we have David Curley with the Discovery Channel. Hi there, sorry, unmuting. Um, for anybody, NASA or SpaceX, uh, was Bob Behnken allowed to leave anything for Megan in the Dragon? And Elon, uh, it's been a long journey uh, with the HLS and everything else. On the arc of what you're hoping to do, are you going faster or slower? I know you had some frustrations early, but where do you see bigger picture we are and where we need to go? Thank you. I guess I'll, I'll take the question of Bob. You know, uh, I don't know of anything specific that he left for Megan. Um, he certainly left a lot of uh, love, tenderness, and care of that vehicle while he flew it. And, you know, for me as the program manager for Commercial Crew, it's, it's pretty exciting to see 
you know, Bob having flown that vehicle for the first time, testing it out and uh, taking it for a spin for his wife, Megan, and she gets to take it for a little longer. So it's, it's kind of cool um, to, to see the two flying the same vehicle uh, and the first time that we've reused that vehicle. So. Yeah, actually, I don't know if people saw the, the zero-G indicator this time, which is uh, this uh, cute, fluffy penguin called My, My First Penguin. Um, you know, it's this cute, cute, fluffy penguin that's floating around in zero-G right now. Um, I don't know if there's a picture of that, but it's yeah, kind of cute. Um, and then, let's see, I mean, uh, it's, yeah, it's been 19 years uh, since starting SpaceX, and uh, certainly a lot of adventures along the way. Some, some tough times and a lot of good times. Um, I'd say it's only recently, though, that I, I think that I, I, I feel that uh, full and rapid reusability can be accomplished. Um, I wasn't sure for a long time, but I'm sure now. Thank you. And next up, we have Jeff Faust with Space News. Uh, good morning. Uh, question for Elon Musk. Um, you know, it took years of development to get the Crew Dragon to the point where you could have a successful series of missions like uh, Crew 2 this morning. Uh, at what point do you think Starship will be ready to start carrying people? Thanks. Well, we are, I think we are trying to keep the questions to, uh, you know, more limited to, to this, you know, this mission. But um, it's difficult to speculate with respect to, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, if, I tend to be, as you as you know, I tend to be somewhat optimistic with respect to schedules. Uh, um, I, f I feel I should acknowledge this. Uh, <laughs> um, but, um, you know, so take that with a grain of salt. But um, I, th I think it's not out of the question that it could be ready to fly, cr fly people in a couple of years. Thanks. Obviously, we need, we need to, like, not be making craters, you know. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, otherwise it's like, hop in, we're, we're going to Mars. No, not quite, not yet. <laughs> um, it's got some work to do, but make, making rapid progress. I think if the, we've got to make sure we're, we're accelerating the rate of innovation. And then it, it could be ready in a couple of years. Thank you. Now we have Eric Nyler with Wired. Uh, greetings. Uh, congratulations to everybody. Um, Senator Bill Nelson mentioned a, a 2024 uh, timetable for for a, a lunar landing uh, through HLS during a, a confirmation hearing on Capitol Hill, and I'm just wondering uh, from Elon whether that's a kind of a crazy talk or is that uh, something you feel optimistic about? I I think that can be done. Um, yeah, I I think so. Um, I, mean, I think we're, yeah, we're we're we're, build, we're building going to build a lot of rockets and we're going to probably smash a bunch of them. But um, I can, I think I think this I think it will happen. I think twenty twenty four, this seems likely. We're going to aim for sooner than that, but I think uh, you know, I think we this this is this is actually doable. Yes. Thanks, and we have time for one more question. Camden Hall from Talk of Titusville. Thanks for taking my question. My question is for Elon. Where were you watching the launch from? Were you in the LTC like you were for Demo 2 or somewhere else? Thanks. Um, yeah, I was in launch control and the, the, yeah. It's funny, it's the same, it's the same, same place, the, the same launch control at where the, the lunar missions were launched from. You know, it's pretty wild. It's the same windows, same glass. Um, so it's a little hard to see out at night. Uh, during the day, it's a lot easier to see out. The, the view from the the roof is actually better from the than the view from launch control. Um, but you get to see all the data there. So, yeah. I don't know. The future's looking good. Like we're, I think we're at the dawn of a new era of space exploration. Thank you again to all of our speakers and to our reporters. That's going to wrap things up for us here. Our Crew 2 mission coverage continues on NASA TV. We'll have live coverage all the way to the International Space Station, including true Crew Dragon docking, hatch opening, 
and the welcome ceremony. Docking is targeting at 5.10 a.m. Saturday, April 24th, with hatch opening at 7.15 a.m. and the welcome ceremony at 7.45 a.m. So stay tuned. Thank you. burn when Dragon is about two and a half kilometers below the station and just about seven kilometers behind it. This will swing Dragon up until it's about 400 meters directly below the station. This maneuver will also move Dragon inside one of two safety zones around the station that requires a set of go no go poles with the different control teams. The first zone is called the approach ellipsoid, which is an imaginary shape measuring four kilometers by two kilometers by two kilometers, essentially a large three dimensional oval. Before Dragon is given permission to move inside the ellipsoid, uh, referred to by the teams as the AE, it's configured to be on what is known as a 24-hour safe trajectory. This means that if Dragon lost all control to its thrusters, it would be at least 24 hours before the trajectory would move inside that approach ellipsoid. Once Dragon arrives at 400 meters below station, it will be at what is known as waypoint zero and will be the first checkpoint during our approach. The vehicle can hold at 400 meters or continue on if all systems check out to approach to waypoint one. By this point, the teams will do a go-no-go -no -go pull for Dragon to move inside the keep out sphere, another zone that consists of an imaginary sphere around the station with a radius of 200 meters. It's another chance to confirm all the guidance, navigation, and control systems are working correctly on Dragon before moving closer to the station and carries a requirement similar to the AE that Dragon's orbital trajectory would not bring it inside that sphere if control was lost, but this time only for four orbits or about six hours instead of 24 hours. Dragon's move from waypoint zero to waypoint one will swing it up and out in front of the station, pausing at a distance of approximately 220 meters. At this point, it will be on what we call the docking axis, which essentially means it's directly in front of the docking port. The crew is headed to the forward most port on the International Space Station, the Node 2 forward port. That's where Dragon docked for both of our demonstration missions and where one of two international docking adapters is located. These were installed for new commercial spacecraft flights and any other future spacecraft that also use the international docking standard. Once Dragon is only 20 meters away at waypoint two, the spacecraft focuses on aligning its docking system with the docking adapter. Dragon will then fly in and make contact with the IDA, giving us what we call soft capture. The soft capture ring then retracts until sensors indicate it's time for hooks to drive in place to give us a hard capture and firmly secure Dragon to the station. Then it's time for leak checks and hatch opening, which, will, which is currently timeline to come about two hours following docking. So we have a lot of action still to come, so stay with us as we follow Dragon carrying NASA's Crew-2 astronauts to the International Space Station. Thanks, Gary. The crew is awake aboard the station now, getting ready to welcome the crew to astronauts tomorrow. The crew on board the station was actually watching our coverage, watching the launch play out. Astronaut Victor Glover tweeted a tweeted four pictures of the broadcast and the crew watching aboard the International Space Station. His tweet read, welcome to low Earth orbit endeavor, Godspeed. Tomorrow on docking day, NASA's Victor Glover will be prime for monitoring Dragon for its final approach and will take the lead on hatch operations. Once the, hatch, the hatches are opened after Crew 2's arrival, we'll have 11 people living aboard the station for the next few days. Station Commander Shannon Walker will give the new arrivals a safety briefing. They'll have a light day before heading to sleep early while the rest of the Expedition 65 crew conducts some additional science and continues preparations for Crew 1 to return home. Meanwhile, here in Mission Control Houston, the Orbit 2 team is now on console after a shift handover. The team of flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston is now being led by
by Flight Director Adi Bulos. Several hours before the crew boarded Dragon, the space station team did their own go no go poll, and there were several systems that we had to ensure were fully functioning properly before NASA could give their go for launch. Everything is still looking good on the station side for Dragon's arrival, so that'll do it for us here in Mission Control Houston. Now back over to Hawthorne. All right, thanks, Courtney. Good to hear that everything's good on that side. Over the last 20 years, crews aboard the space station have completed over 3,000 scientific and educational experiments, and Crew 2 is prepared to add to that growing number. Once Crew 2 arrives at the space station, they'll spend the next six months working in our orbital laboratory, having seven crew members on board, with five of those on the U.S. side compared to the three we've had for years, significantly expands the amount of research that can be conducted.